Good day to all. This is our first part of our discussions involving valuing stocks or stocks valuation. If you can recall with our previously released videos, we had our two parts discussions about valuing bonds. So there's a bit of discussion there about comparing the two about bonds and stocks. So hopefully you had your good times there and you were able to take note of the details. Anyway, we are going to continue with this chapter. So we have here debt versus equity, the comparison. For the debt, we have to take note that in comparison with equity securities, the debt securities would normally represent a legally enforceable claim. So in other words, if for example, we are the creditors here, then we can get the claims to cash or the cash claims coming from the debtors. So these particular cash flows normally would be in the form of principal and interest. That's why for debt securities, they would offer fixed or floating cash flows. If you can recall, normally the payments would be fixed when it comes to the principal, but then interest could also vary if not fixed. Now, for those who are holding bonds, especially for debt securities, for example, the bonds payable, which would be the classic examples or the usual examples, we have to take note that they do not have any control over how the company is run because basically they are just people literally outside the organization. People could be natural or artificial persons, but normally these are businesses, so issuing bonds. Now, on the part of, for example, the bondholders who are holding the bonds, basically, they are creditors, literally, again, outside the organization. They do not have control or power in the operations of the debtor, for example, the debtor company or corporation. So in that particular case, it's just as simple as being just a party to a debt contract being again a creditor in that. So this is an opposite or as opposed to equity securities wherein the equity would be, of course, if these are the securities would be owned by the so-called shareholders of the corporation, then these are in the forms of shares or stocks. And then these shares or stocks will have dividends as as shares from the profits of the corporation. And then because we are shareholders, so we would be getting variable amounts or values of dividends because these dividends in terms of values and amounts would also be depending or would depend on the values of the declarations of the dividends coming from the accumulated profits and losses of the corporation. So that's why you would expect that if we are shareholders, that the returns of our investments would vary also depending on such corporations' dividends. Then, in addition to that, as discussed, there would also be additional values like the capital gains and losses. So in other words, the values of shares would increase over time because such as capital gains, but if such would decrease, so capital losses. And we will discuss them more. We will be discussing such as we go along the way. Now, the shareholders have control over how the company is run, but not directly. They can actually do such by participating in the votation, most especially with the important matters in running the corporation. Also, they can vote for the best board of directors members or the component members so that we will make sure or they will make sure that the corporation is managed and run by the best technical and adept or skilled people to run overall of the corporation or business. So moving on, we have here as discussed that the equity shareholders or holders actually are the residual claimants of the organization or corporation, meaning to say they would be receiving something after 
the liabilities have been exhausted or fully paid or extinguished. Now, for the stockholders or shareholders, they're actually classified into two. The preferred stockholders, now known as preference shareholders, and the common stockholders, now known as ordinary shareholders. From the word preferred, so, or preference, in the word preference, the root word is prefer. So in case that the corporation would be issuing dividends, so the preference shareholders or the preferred stockholders will be receiving ahead or in advance of the common stockholders or the ordinary shareholders. But that would be in a form, of course, of percentage of the dividends declared by the corporation. And then after that, the ordinary shareholders or common stockholders will be receiving what will remain. So this is the reason as discussed that common stockholders are called residual claimants. Now, for a while ago, I discussed about the debtors who will be paid or who will be paying rather the creditors. So for their principal cash flows and interests, but it's a different thing when it comes to the equity holders or the stockholders, because again, they will be in the form of dividends. And then these are the shares of the profits of the corporation, but the capital gains would be the paper gains as well as the capital losses. So we call them as such paper gains or losses because they are still unrealized. They will only be realized or they will come into full existence or existence once the shares are being sold. So in accounting parlance, when we say realization, meaning to say, we're able to get the proceeds or the cash from such asset or assets when we sell or dispose them. Now, no claim to earnings or assets until all senior claims are paid in full. This is true. As said, in terms of dividends, so the preference shareholders would be given first or the preferred stockholders, and then after, of which will provide to the uh, common stockholders or the ordinary shareholders. Then high risk, but historically also high return. Remember, if we now compare, we will forget the debt instruments or bonds payable because anyway, the amounts normally are to be received as fixed. So we just focus with the equity holders. So preference shareholders, also known as, again, as preferred stockholders versus the ordinary shareholders or common stockholders, wherein the preferred stockholders would be getting the amount first or amounts of the dividends first with certain percentages before the common stockholders. And then this means that the common stockholders would be receiving what is left or the other parts of the cake. So if ever the cake is small, it's possible that the preference shareholders would be getting the majority or all or only little or nothing with the latter. And if ever the corporation would be really be having substantial amounts of profits and it would also be issuing substantial values of dividends. So the preferred shareholders would be getting certain percentages and the more amounts will be obtained by the common stockholders. So in other words, the bigger the cake, the bigger the pie, so the better for the common stockholders. But then again, high risk, because there is really that concept about the direct relationship between the risks and returns. So if you want to have more returns, we should be ready to embrace more risks. That's why the higher the risk, the higher the return. And then that's why, again, if we are now the common stockholders or ordinary shareholders, we are going to be exposed to more risks because will be getting the differential. But then based on history, overall, despite the fluctuations of values, the ordinary shareholders are actually going to receive the high returns if they just have to maintain their investments. Now, we also have to take note that stockholders or shareholders have voting rights so that they can express their say or vote in the form of votes on important company decisions. Then, 
the debt, if we compare with equity, they have substantially different marginal benefit and marginal costs. Remember that these two items are on different sections on the statement of financial position or balance sheet. One will have to pay, for example, such liabilities. And then another section for the equity will be the company will be issuing dividends to the shareholders. So that's the case though. And in terms of the comparison a while ago as discussed, so whoever are the creditors for the bonds payable, they are not part of the organization, but the creditors in the equity section, the shareholders, they're clearly part of the corporation. Now preferred stock as discussed will be having some features similar to debt and other features similar to equity. In what way preferred stock are or stocks are similar to debt because basically they will be receiving or they will be getting dividends or dividend payments based on certain percentages. So for example, 8% or whatever percent that is. And that will be multiplied with the amount of ordinary preferred stock or preference share capital. And that will be the amount or value of the dividends to be allocated to preferred or preference stock or share respectively. Now that is discussed already in corporation accounting as to how we allocate dividends. So claim on assets and cash flow is senior to common stock. As said, they are to be prioritized compared with the others. Then in cases of tax deductions, normally there wouldn't be tax deductions. Anyway, this is in US. It's going to be different in the Philippines because we have actually our different final tax rates or the passive income tax rates in the form of final taxes. So it's different here in the Philippines. Then preferred stocks are held mostly by corporations. And as much as they are based on percentages like that, but then there are still equity components or there are still equity types of shares. Then promises a fixed annual dividend payment, though this is not legally enforceable. So as said, they will be preferred, they will be prioritized in cases that the corporation would be issuing dividends, but then they are not actually guaranteed. They are not really promised that they will be receiving always. Then preferred stockholders usually do not have voting rights, but not all. Common stock or ordinary shares. The par value will be, of course, the value per share. And that is also true for the preferred stock or preference share. This is of little economic relevance today because normally the fair value of the shares would not be equal to the par value. Now the authorized shares would be the shares in which from the articles of incorporation of a corporation that the board of directors and then the shareholders, of course, as represented by the board, authorizes the firm to sell to the public such number of shares. Then the, or the second one, in terms of the term here for the shares would be the shares issued. So the shares issued would be shares clearly or obviously which have already been issued or sold to the public. So they're now in the hands of certain persons known as shareholders. Outstanding shares, these are the shares issued less any treasury shares. So treasury shares, Let's check if they will be discussed, but then let's discuss in advance. These are the shares in which the corporation actually have bought them back because these are defaulted shares which are not actually paid. So delinquent shares or defaulted shares coming from the subscribed shares or shares that are being bought on account, then the subscribers defaulted and they become delinquent. So the corporation made some biddings, but then nobody bought the share. So they bought such back. And these shares will become treasury shares. So if deducted from issued shares, they would become 
shares outstanding. Next, any excess of the fair value of the share over the par value is called additional paid in capital, which is now known as share premium. The rights of ordinary shareholders normally or can be exercised in person or by proxy or a representative. And then this is in the US though that most US corporations practice majority voting with one vote attached to each common share. However, in the Philippine setting, normally it's cumulative voting. We're in for every holder of share, such person can of course vote depending on the number of persons to be voted. For example, let's say the minimum for the number of board of directors would be five members. So for each share, that person can vote maximum of five votes. So it's one times five members of the board. That person can allocate that number of votes to just one or certain combinations or one for each. But then it's not a requirement to give one for each. That's actually the point of cumulative voting. Now, proxy fight is an attempt to gain control of a firm by soliciting enough votes to unseat existing directors. So this is like a situation where in unethically, a person is looking for prospective persons who are against any existing director or directors, and then the plan is to kick them out from their positions. Shareholders have no legal rights to receive dividends. As said again, the corporation has no legal obligation to really issue dividends whatsoever, like regularly. However, because of like the practice, especially nowadays, that shareholders would be also wanting to experience and get their shares from the profits of the corporation. That's why they are released regularly, but of various or of different amounts. But then overall, guys, if you look into the law or laws, the corporations are not legally obligated to pay dividends to shareholders, nor shareholders have legal rights to receive such. Now, we have to know primary markets versus secondary markets. In issuing new securities, if this is the first time, then we call such as the primary market. For the market capitalization, this would be total number of shares multiplied by the current price or the market price or the fair value of such shares. Then, as I discussed a while ago, these are treasury stocks or shares which have been issued, but then they are no longer outstanding as explained that normally they begin with subscription or acquisition of shares on account. Then such subscribers did not pay them on time or as needed, such becoming defaulted or delinquent shares. And then the corporations in the interest of issuing them to any existing or new or interested investors or parties, but then to no avail. So such was not able to look for actual persons who will be or who will buy the shares. So in that case, the corporation would be buying back such. So repurchased such shares. And as I said, they will be deducted from the issued shares to get the outstanding shares. Literally outstanding, so outside. So they are in the hands of those people outside the organizations or the investors or shareholders. But what about the board of directors? Well, there are just a few of the many shareholders because to become a board of director, one should be a shareholder. So in that case though, like the BOD members are just few of the thousands or millions of shareholders. Now, what's the investment banker's role in equity issues? So there are some organizations called as investment banks, or actually there are banks, but then they have a certain affiliate or branch perhaps, or let's say a subsidiary that is acting as an investment banker. So the activities would be trading, the buying and selling of the shares, and then managing the assets, especially for the long-term purposed or driven 
equity shares. So there are some equity shares in which the focus would be for long term and assets are managed properly. Also corporate finance. So in terms of really, for example, the proper management of the shares and securities, especially the equity securities as to be discussed as discussed as well also in this chapter. Then for corporate finance, investment banks assist firms in the process of issuing securities to investors. Recall the primary market a while ago, wherein that is the market that we issue shares for the first time. So investment banks can assist the firms with the legal processes, the requirements up to the final stage that the shares will be finally issued to certain investors. Then IPO, this is the first public sale to outside investors of the corporation or company. Now, there's also such a thing as an seasoned offering wherein an equity issued by a firm that already has common stock outstanding. So the corporation here has common stock or has ordinary shares and then it issues more. So this is the so-called unseasoned offering or let's just say not really on a timing offering because the first season for a corporation would be the IPO, the initial public offering. All right, so firms can choose an investment bank through negotiated offer. So it's a matter of one looking for the prospect. So one investment bank looking for the company or companies or corporations who are interested with their IPOs to be processed or legally assisted. So that's the negotiated offer. Well, the competitively bid offer is that the corporation would be looking for potential investment banks and they will be laying down their respective, let's say perks or benefits. So the contract to sell equity can be in the best effort. The bank promises its best effort or efforts to sell the firm security. So the bank would be looking for interested investors. If the demand is insufficient, so the issue will be withdrawn. So in other words, if we cannot look really for the number or quantity of the number of buyers or investors or interested shareholders of the shares, so this particular issue, the initial public offering will be canceled or withdrawn. Then firm commitment on another hand is that the bank underwrites the securities. So in underwriting, the bank would be buying the said securities and then they would be reselling them to investors. So this is also one thing. The buyer, which is the bank, now becomes like the major shareholder of the corporation. And then with that underwriting, contract though, it is required to really resell them to investors. Now, what are the key steps in the IPO process? So we have the main steps and events. Initial step is to select book running manager and co-manager. And the role of the underwriter here, which is the investment bank, would be book running manager's role includes forming the syndicate and overseeing the entire process. So what is a syndicate as being shown here? A syndicate is an organization that is actually the investment bank here that is charged with the underwriting process. So it would be buying again the shares coming from the corporation and would be looking for potential investors to buy, to buy the shares. And then we have here the syndicate that would be overseeing the entire process. Next is letter of intent. The letter specifies gross spread and green show or over allotment as specified here, option and protects underwriter from unexpected expenses. So that also the underwriter wouldn't be suffering from such. Then we have to take note though that this does not guarantee price or number of shares to be issued. For this one, this is easier because we are talking about the registration process in which we'll be now dealing with the SEC requirements. We have registration statement and due diligence. After conducting due diligence, underwriter files for a necessary registration statement with SEC. And then we have here a unique term, 
or concept about red airing. Once registration statement is filed with SEC, it is transformed into a preliminary prospectus. So this prospectus, which is of course, like the steps and the statements that are being procured at for the registration, basically is preliminary. So this is the red airing. And this is important because for the next step, this will be used. For marketing, we now distribute prospectus roadshow. So the red airing is sent to salespeople and institutional investors around the country. This is by the way for US, which is quite composed of a lot of states, 50 plus. Concurrently, company and underwriter conduct a roadshow and the IB builds a book based on express demand, but not legally binding. So express demand, meaning interested investors who would like to buy the shares, but we just have to take note again that this is not bound by the law that you are expressing your intention to buy such shares. Now you have to pay for such. It doesn't mean. Then pricing and allocation. Once registration statement has SEC approval, underwriter asks the SEC to accelerate the date in which the issue becomes effective. Firm and underwriter meet the day before the offer to determine price. So these are the items, now the details, the number of shares and allocation of shares. So those who are interested or who were interested to buy the shares, of course, will be part of the list with the allocation of shares. Then after that, we have aftermarket activities. So we do stabilization if you are in the part of the investment bank, of course, over allotment option. Underwriter supports the stock price by purchasing or purchasing shares if price declines. So what does this mean? Or what does it mean? Well, we have to take note that if, for example, there are a lot of interested parties who will be buying the shares and the number of shares remaining are lower, so which is, or we can just imagine that the price would be increasing. And the opposite is true if, for example, no one or nobody would be interested to buy the shares or only few, hopefully not necessarily like, or not literally no one or nobody. So the price then would be, and again, the opposite is true if that's the case. So we are not hoping again it's zero, but let's just say it's just lower number of those who are expressing interested people and then they are having the express demand to buy the shares. So if there are only few of them, law of demand and supply, so the price would literally go down. In that case, to support the stock price, the underwriter or investment bank would be buying or purchasing the shares in order to control it. So in order to make like a demand, but that demand is done by the underwriter itself or the investment bank acting as an, the underwriter. And then if stock price goes up, so this is a matter again of interplay of demand and supply. A while ago, if like lower demand, so more supply. So in that case, the price tends to go down or the price really went down or declined. And then the underwriter buys the shares to create the demand to stabilize the price. But then if the price would really go up, so in that case, the demand is now high and the supply of the shares would be lower. So the underwriter would be using the over allotment option to cover short position. If you can recall the letter of intent that discusses about the green show. And then this has discussed about the over allotment. So in that case, it's like a buffer or a reserve that we can apply so that in case that we are short or meaning to say we are losing because there are actually higher stock prices, so we use that or we apply that. On another hand, if the price would really go down, so the underwriter covers over allotment, meaning to say hide that particular over allotment, so meaning many buyers or interested parties by buying stocks in open market so that there would be more shares that such can provide to those who are really interested on top of what can 
only be available coming from this particular company. So let's say the existing number of shares would be 100 and then it's now 120. Those who are interested parties who will be buying the share. So where do we get the 20? We now buy such from the open market. And this is the green show. So research coverage, the final stage of IPO process begins 25 calendar days after IPO, which means initial public offering when the quiet period ends. Only after this can underwriter and other syndicate members comment on the value of the firm and provide earnings estimates. So this is now like valuing the company and the shares and all about that. So this is like the research coverage and the final stage of the initial public offering. Then what about for secondary markets for equity securities? So we have the broker market, a broker necessarily is a middleman or agent who will be looking for interested buyers and sellers of certain products. In this case, we're talking about the securities. So in other words, the broker market will be acting as an agent in order for the sale transaction for the shares would take happen. Now the broker normally or brokers would be having the trading. So they're going to deal with trading of securities, the buy and sell of such. On the other hand, for a dealer market, this is where the buyer and seller are not brought together directly, but instead have their orders executed by securities dealers that make markets in the given security. So these dealers are actually making as if there is really a market for such shares. All right, so this is the difference of the two. To highlight, for a broker market, normally there's really a formal securities exchange market and buyers and sellers are being brought together. In dealer's market, they're also brought together. However, that particular dealer is the one, for example, looking for interested buyer of the shares or interested seller of the shares because somebody wants to buy and that person would be acting as agent in between. So buying such sold shares and then selling such to interested parties to buy. So that's why we have the securities brokers versus the securities dealers. And then broker is directly, but dealer market or the dealer is indirectly. Then these are examples of secondary markets in the US, both brokers and dealers. So for the broker markets, we have really the organized security exchanges, so national and the regional. We have here the very known NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange. On another hand, we have the dealer markets with the NASDAQ and the OTC. So we have here our NASDAQ, which is really an organization also about the shares and the OTC. Now NASDAQ has been already explained in other lessons as examples of dealer markets. We can also locate the meaning of NASDAQ, which is quite not really an English world because it is a combination of a lot of words coming from various languages. So it's acting like an acronym. And then OTC as well. And these are examples coming from the US, but these are also well-known dealers, just like the NASDAQ. And then for the broker, the New York Stock Exchange. All right, so hopefully you learned something and you will learn something from this session. Thank you very much for listening. Watch out for the second part or the subsequent part wherein we will be discussing now more on computations. Thank you very much and God bless as all as always. Bye for now.